grasping the thin, almost translucent veil between that of fact and fiction, revealing mysteries of the past, folklore passed down from father to son, unsolved murders, and things that go bump in the night. You've entered Deceptive Reality. Hello and welcome once again to the Deceptive Reality Podcast. My name is Nick and this is the Fashionable Bert. Oh, Fashionable, listen, hey. And I've got this great Isn't shirt that... on. Y'all gonna, listen, y'all gonna enjoy this. Look at this ah. shirt. I got a Yeah, you gotta get over to YouTube. Foot. Man, I got all the things. And for those of you that isn't watching on YouTube, sorry, I'm not putting that on Instagram. I might put it on Instagram. Who knows? You could. Listen, you could. I do life on the edge sometimes, Nick. I, you never know with me. I look forward to seeing your new shirt every time we do one of these. <laughs> and after a couple of years, you're going to have to have a new house just to have closets for all these. I mean, let's be honest. That's like my T-shirt collection already. I, I bet I probably have. <laughs> 200 t-shirts probably something stupid oh geez i probably at least have 150 at least oh really i've got well oh. dresser drawers i've got two entire dresser drawers full and then some you are fashionable one might say you're a fashionista i am who oh, fashionista yeah. <laughs> So this one is my week. I'm super excited about this one. Also, I'm sure you guys have noticed uh, when we came up with this genius idea is what I'm going to call this. We've mm. added some sound effects and some music. So what you guys have probably heard, we've not mentioned it up to this point because honestly, we didn't think about it till now. And we're a few episodes ahead. Actually, I was laughing because the episode that's coming out this coming Friday I was so confused when we recorded it, what week it was coming out <laughs> that I'm like, this is coming out like one of those weeks, uh, which is super funny, but yeah, hopefully y'all are enjoying that. If you're not enjoying it, uh-huh. I don't know what's wrong with you. I think it adds a little flavor. Yeah. This episode is a spicy one. If you have stereo oh. headphones, that's what you're going to want to listen to this on. Oh, I'm so excited right now. And this I've lost a good one. total track of space and time. I am not mentioning anything about when I think an episode's coming out. <laughs> uh, I'm just not talking about that. <laughs> yeah, this, listen, we've got a few in the hoppers, what we're going to say. we got a few oh, in the yeah. hopper. Speaking of hopper, unrelated but somewhat related, I don't know if you've seen them, Nick. They've got the Stranger Things 4 trading cards. No, I haven't. Yes, those are out. I bought a booster oh. box the other day that had a hopper, the hop, the guy. Yeah. Forget what the guy's real name is, but it was a special edition card and I was super excited. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. I was super <sighs> excited about it. I, I, I wish somehow we could get stranger things out quicker. Yeah, no I, doubt. I They're going to be like now. 37 years old by the time this thing's done. Oh, no. <laughs> and, I, and I'll be dust in the wind. <laughs> oh, for sure. Last season, for sure. Last it is. season. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it, but I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, me too. Me too. Like, I, I don't want things to go on forever. Well, and I think you can only take that story so far, but I bet you anything there'll yeah. be a spinoff. Oh, yeah. They've talked about that already. And I'm cool Which with that. Smart. For anyone that's not watched Stranger Things, you should watch it. It's definitely up there in the realm of sci-fi that I enjoy. Where the heck have you been living if you've not watched Stranger Things? I don't think my parents have watched it yet. Where do they live? No, don't tell me that. Don't talk. They don't. Let me tell you this much. (laughs) They live in an area where internet has not been a thing for a while. Oh, yeah. That's where I used to live. And you got to have the Wi-Fi for stuff like that. Yeah, well, so they got to watch it. They should come over to your house and watch it. It could be a togetherness thing. You could have could. popcorn. You could have true. chicken nuggies. Everything. That's true. I mean, yeah, chicken wings with a bone in it. That's bad. Uh, oh, I don't know about that, but agree <laughs> to disagree. Anyway, have your parents over. Watch Stranger Things. It'd be worth the, it'd be worth the yeah. enjoyment of the moment it, at a minimum, Nick. 
See, I'm always, always trying to do nice things for your parents because I think that is true. I want them to like me. I want I mean, them to be fans of me. If we're being honest, when we talk about the podcast, I mm-hmm. could literally bring Bigfoot on as a as another like person. Right. It'd be <laughs> And everyone, my, I guarantee my parents would be like, did you see Nick laugh and do that joke that he did? That was so funny. And I'd be like, this is what I want. This is my true goal in this podcast to win over your parents. <laughs> What's well, working by God. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I know mom's going to love this episode. I oh. built this one up and this one is going to be a banger. I think I, I'm excited. Are you, are you going to make me wait much longer? Cause I kind of, Nope. Are you, are you ready to get it started? It looks like this narration we're at 10 minutes. I really reduced this down for me. Oh, Cause you know, okay. mine's typically longer than 10 minutes. Oh, heck yeah. But I think the sound effects is going to add a little pizzazz. Who's ready. Oh, I'm ready. Don't stranger things me. Give it to me now. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go. In that moment, when the clock ceases its relentless ticking and the air grows thick with tension, reality itself seems to hold its breath. For the Doe family, time would come to a standstill, suspended in a reality far removed from what any of us would consider normal. As autumn leaves gave way to winter's chill in the late 1940s, this ordinary family in a nondescript Maryland town stepped unwittingly onto a path that would lead them far away from the ordinary into a chilling narrative that defies explanation. Welcome back to another episode of Deceptive Reality. Today, we delve into a story that has perplexed and captivated the world for decades. A tale of mystery so confounding it inspired one of the most chilling films ever made. I'm talking about The Exorcist. But did you know that before it became a sensation on the big screen, it was a living nightmare for one Maryland family. A nightmare that all started with some seemingly innocent anomalies in their own home. I have literally got cold chills. That was awesome. <laughs> this is a fun one. And for anyone that doesn't oh, know, yeah. the, the, the Exorcist is out right now. It's in mm-hmm. theaters. Uh, Nick, you watched it. I've not seen it yet. I did. I, I think I had too high expectations for it. Well, I thought it was just okay. That first one... When you have to live against that first one, it's going to be hard to beat right. yeah. the expectations of that. That first one was just a banger. This story mm-hmm. is deep. It's really deep. And I'm oh, going to yeah. try it. I've got stuff wrote down. I've got notes. There's a lot that I did not put in the narr- The narration is just the meat and potatoes is what I'm going to call it. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not all in. It's not all the gusto, uh, but we're going to cover it. But there's a lot to this story. And I thought I knew the entire story. I did not know the entire story. I'm curious how much I know of the story. Cause I also think I know a lot of the story, but uh, man, the way you research things, if you're saying that it makes me think I don't know anything about it. There was a few things that I didn't know. And honestly, the reason that I figured a lot of this out for one, mm-hmm. I read an entire book from a skeptic that did a lot of the research ahead. And let me tell you, they brought okay. a lot to the table that I didn't know. Right. Um, and the book was kind of interesting is how I'll put it. I'm actually looking for it. So it's not that I'm not looking at you guys. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, the book, okay. the book that I read was called The Devil Came to St. Louis. Oh, interesting. How long has that been out? Quite a while. Uh, for a while. Yeah. It's an older book. Hmm. Uh, but it was basically wrote by a skeptic that had all the information. And even though he was a skeptic, he still gave some facts in there that he was like, I can't explain this or right. this that, doesn't that's make an sense. honest skeptic is what it's I call an that. Honest skeptic. Right. Very. Did he remain skeptic. skeptic? Um, at the end of the book, he left it very inconclusive is how I'll put it. Okay. He he gave his hypothesis as far as this is what I think is there, 
Right. But he really stayed more to the facts. Okay. Like he was very fact driven. Right. I appreciate that. But yeah, me too. Like there was a part that I'll cover at some point. Uh, yeah, at some point I'll cover it. Uh, maybe segment three or four. But okay. he brought up something that he researched and he had all the ins and outs. I've got the info here on the side. But it's interesting the spin that it turns the story, which is crazy. Okay. But okay. that little teaser I gave you was just kind of the the beginning go to is what I'll call it. Right. Uh, this next segment kind of goes into the very what I'm going to call the beginning. And I'm starting from. Not what happens. We'll talk about that after the segments, if that makes sense. Right. No, I, I hate to keep going on about the sound effects, but I literally had cold chills, so I'm super pumped to hear the rest <laughs> of this. We haven't even got to the good stuff yet, Nick. I know, just that part. <laughs> Did you see me when that knock happened? Yeah. I was like, was that, was that? Was, was that here? Was <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, well, beautiful using, work, man. I have uh, actually this software that I've been using, and it's got something like 200,000 sound effects. It's called Soundly wow. for anyone that's ever looking for sound effects. It's soundly.com. Yeah. But I've got a subscription to them. And pretty much if you put it in there, they've got it. There's some effects that I use for like Bigfoot effects and stuff like that. That's a little different, okay. but I think it adds a lot to these stories. It's like negative ASMR for me, except I really like it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man. You ready to get this story going, Nick? Uh, yeah, let's let's get into the real the real meat here. Imagine a picture perfect post-war America, a time of hope and simple joys. This was the world Roland Doe knew before the inexplicable events that would rock his family's life. In many ways, Roland was your typical American boy. He attended school, enjoyed fishing trips, and spent weekends with his family, living what many would consider an idyllic childhood. But life has a way of showing us that appearances can be deceptive, that underneath the surface of what we deem normal may lurk questions without easy answers. For Roland and his family, this realization was about to turn their world upside down. The first signs were subtle, so subtle that they were easily dismissed. It was the winter of late 1948, and the Doe family began to notice anomalies that were difficult to explain. In a home once filled with the comforting sounds of daily life, laughter, conversations, the clinking of dinnerware, new, unsettling noises began to emerge. At first, it was just the odd scratching in the walls, easily blamed on rodents. Perhaps a wayward raccoon had made its home within the insulation. Next came the soft tapping sounds, almost like distant footsteps, too rhythmic to be just the house set but then, household objects seemed to rebel against the laws of physics. A vase would shift inches from its original spot, a picture frame tilted on its own, and all the while, the scratching and tapping escalated, as though whatever was causing these disturbances was growing emboldened by the day. Looking back, these were more than mere quirks or oddities. They were the harbingers of something much darker, a prologue to a tale that defies comprehension. For Roland and his family, the veil between the explainable and the inexplicable was beginning to lift, ushering in a chapter of their lives that would be anything but ordinary. Yeah. I, I'm already noticing familiar things. I was just getting ready to ask you. Yeah. I, I didn't want to be rude, so I waited till we got through the narrate, narration, but the stages of possession, we're going to see that again here. It's already happening. And I mm -hmm. find it so amazing that it's like a script that demons have to follow. Do you find that too? It's like there's specific rules. You know what I found very eerie about this entire thing? What? Think about the infilled poltergeist. Right. That's what I many was thinking. Of the, many of the things that they, and they called that a poltergeist. I don't yep. believe that was ever a poltergeist. No, we, we decided and solved it that it wasn't. It was demonic possession. Correct. And it's, it's yeah. following the, the same format as what this one is, with, within reason, obviously. Can I read this little thing I just found? Yes. Stage one, infestation. This is haunted house type stuff. Footsteps, voices, knocking, 
furniture and other objects moving around without human agency, odors with no discernible source. Rather than directly affecting people, infestations only affect property, objects, or animals. And that's exactly what we just heard. And that's exactly Correct. how the Enfield poltergeist started. Correct. I, there's a theory that goes around it that the way that a demon has to come in, it has to somewhat, it, I'm trying to think of a good example in like real life, right? Okay. Here's, here's, here's a good example. If you're wanting to, well, not, not a lot of people's going to get that reference. Uh, sometimes you have to do certain things to, to make things work, right? Okay. Like if you buy a toy, you might have a toy that can do stuff, but it can't do anything Mm -hmm. fun unless you put batteries in it. Right. Right. So what a demon does is creates this paradox in your life that opens up doors that it can't open on its own. Right. Would you say it might be fair to say they're breaking down resistances so people are more receptive to the batteries? Oh, for sure. Like everything that skeptics talk about, which is, well, that can be explained away based on whatever, right? Which Mm -hmm. drives me crazy. Like the the, the number one thing of a skeptic is, well, if you're a ghost hunter, you're going to go into a house with the expectation there's a ghost. And no matter what it is, you're going to hear what you think is a ghost, even if it's not right. Demons are doing the same thing. They're doing things that at first you can go, well, that might be like a raccoon. It might be a squirrel. Right. You know, like they said, the family thought it was just an infestation of some type of animal in their foundation and stuff like that. Similar to the infield poltergeist. Right. But then after a while you go, that's not normal. That's animals don't do that. And then it starts right. putting new ideas and concepts in your mind. And then you become what you become scared, which is the first, mm-hmm. the infestation part you're talking about. Right. That's going to turn into like a depression because you can't, you get depressed because you can't figure out what it is. So it's, it's called oppression is the next step. Do you want me to read this o- one too? I thought it would, when's depression come after oppression? Uh, well, depression would fit into oppression. Cause the stages that they um, talk because about it's, when. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was just going to say it's infestation, oppression, which would cover depression or whatever. Mm-hmm. Then it's obsession and then it's possession. Yes. So the uh, very similar, whenever you read a book on demonology they talk about infestation first depression Mm -hmm. second because you cannot oppress someone unless they're depressed right but they call that a completely separate stage so it's infestation five yeah i don't that every book i've read on demonology everyone becomes depressed before before they become oppressed Ah, okay so depression is a state of mind. Oppression is a state of being is the way they view that. That makes sense. Yeah. So to oppress something, you have to depress it. You have to, you have to put it in the right mindset. It's very similar to like a, a bad relationship, so to speak. Right. If you're in a bad relationship, sometimes people don't know they're in a bad relationship because the other person has beat them down to the point to where what's normal for everyone else to see, you don't see because right. it creates that mindset. That's what a demon's doing with depression. They're bringing your ambitions on life so far down that it then becomes easier to oppress. Yeah. There, there's a bunch of different uh, sources for this. So I think mm-hmm. I haven't found the one that you're talking about now. Yeah. I just read mine in uh, demonology books because I was really into demonology for a while. But yeah. then I was like, I ain't messing with that because they, they might get a hold of me. <laughs> oh, I'm super interested in that. If they let agnostics into exorcism school, I'd be gone tomorrow. I mean, people are going to be like, why the heck does this guy believe in this? <laughs> well, and that's the thing. What a lot of people does not know is that there's really only one branch of religion that really specializes in mm-hmm. this. All of them touches on it, but most religions, once it gets this far across, 
will always go back to the Catholic Church. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people goes, well, that goes to show that the Catholic Church is the the correct way to go. I don't necessarily believe that. No, I don't think they believe that either. Yeah, is they just they have the tools capable, right? right? If you go back to biblical terminology and stuff like that, technically the those rules was founded when Jesus came in is is the way right. that most religious scholars look at it and then he gave it to his disciples after that. So, very interesting stuff though. Now, out of curiosity, do you know how in the world he became supposedly in the, or how it, how it all started. Do you know how this, I didn't put it in the narration, but do you know how it started? This particular case? Mm-hmm. No, I don't, I don't think I do. So supposedly I've got two different theories. Well, okay. I've got one theory and then I've got the skeptical point of view also. The interesting narrative start of mm-hmm. the story is, and we're going to call this guy Roland Doe. I actually have his correct name. I'm not going to provide this in the story because oh, okay. I've, I feel weird about it. It's out there. If you want to know what the person's real name is, it's out there. Right. Uh, but we're going to call this guy Roland Doe, Doe through the entire thing in the family, the Doe family, just because the Catholic Church was never one to break. There's not going to be a lot of photos. I've right. legit got nothing. Is, is this fellow Instagram. still around? Do you know? Or He died in 2021, which is why his oh, name was okay. released. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Either died in 2020 or 2021, one of the two. So, so pretty recently, died, really. Yeah. When he died, they released the name. Because okay. at that point, the Catholic Church based... Well, the Catholic Church didn't release it. A uh, reporter did. Okay. Somehow he got the information and the... Uh, I don't think the Catholic church ever admitted that that was the name, but they knew that okay. was the name. It was. Yeah. Well, at that point, I don't think it matters that much. Well, and at that point now, since you got the real name, you can do a little research to see what happened after the exorcism. Mm. So I got that info too. Um, Became an accountant. <laughs> yeah, kind no, just of. Kidding. <laughs> um, it was actually interesting. So supposedly what happened from a narrative standpoint Right. Is Roland Doe had mm-hmm. an aunt that he loved. And okay. his aunt did not live near him. The aunt ended up coming and oh, moving near I him. I did hear this. Yeah. And the okay. aunt was part of the occult. Right. And Roland got super interested in the occult. And one of the things that they believe brought this all in was a Ouija board. Yeah. I had heard this before. Now, what made the story so interesting and, and how the story goes, and it makes for a great story. I I totally would have included this in the narration, but once I read the skeptical view, I'm like, mm. mm-hmm. supposedly the ant died. Okay. Roland was just destroyed. Him and his mom was laying on the bed, and they start hearing footsteps. Okay. And... Roland had said, is that aunt such and such? Right. And supposedly they both heard an audible response through knocks and other stuff, which was yes and no to determine that was the aunt. Now, I might be remembering this wrong and getting things messed up, but the Mm -hmm. Exorcist book by William Blatty, I think that's what his name was, right? Yes. It started similarly, did it not? Uh, yes, kinda. There was some things that was a little bit different, but yeah, for the most part, it was pretty close. All right. Now in that book, the mother was like a staunch atheist. Is that, are we going to find that out about this fellow's mom? It's not in the narration, but the family was extremely religious, extremely religious. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, they took a turn on that one then. Yeah. They were very much a part of, they were very anti the occult. Mm-hmm. Um, the mom was literally ticked off that the right. aunt was showing Roland the occult stuff. So they don't which like Which goes fun. back into the skeptical point of view. They don't like fun. No. Okay. So the mom, yep. the skeptic came out and said that the truth of the story was because the mom was so ticked at the aunt, 
Right. That part of the story was made up. That the, there was never a point in time when the ant was acknowledged as coming in as the demon in the beginning. He said that was completely okay. fictionalized. The mom was mad. Her husband just went with it because he's married to her. Right. But because she was doing, apparently she wasn't even necessarily huge into the occult or even show and Roland, that kind of stuff. But she just hated the ant so much. Really? She's like, well, I'm going to scorn her by basically saying she caused all this. Oh, this is like, uh, them accusing Mother Leeds of being a witch and making up all kinds of stories about her. Sully According her to name. the skeptic, that is correct. So and what's he basing that off of? Apparently this, the guy that had wrote this book had received a lot of the transcripts from the exorcism and nowhere in any of that was that ever relayed. Hmm. It was supposedly added by the mom later. Okay. I, I was kind of wondering how how he knows that she hated her so much. I believe in interviews okay. uh, between the church, because there's no interviews with the family like news. Right. But between the church and the actual, um, the I guess the family members, it was relayed that she hated. Okay. She even tried to blame to the priests some of this, but they didn't buy into it, supposedly. Right. It was actually quite interesting. I just want to get all the sides of it. The the priest side of it, which was from the skeptics, I could not, because clearly you can't find records of any of this right, stuff, right. stuff. The skeptics' point of view from, when the priests came in, they did not believe that there was any possession going on right. at all. And I think that's when they come into it, that's how they should be, right? Correct. They need to be convinced. The way that the Catholic Church comes in, only 5% of all cases are deemed truly possessed. Right. The rest is all some form of a mental ailment or yeah, like someone and, and needs to increase their meds, stuff like that. In, in their credit, and I don't know if everyone would know this, but 5% sounds like a lot, but they get such a massive caseload. Oh yeah, that they're uh, turning away most. Yeah, the uh, one of the main exorcists, I forget what his name is. They asked him how many exorcisms he went to. Mm. And it was like 5,000 some over the course of whatever it was, 20 some years or whatever, 15 20 years. And they're yeah. like you would literally have to be at like one every week or some one like every three days or something. And he's like, mm -hmm. yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. But he said, I, I heard a story that they had to open up the school because there was so yeah. many and it's getting worse. Cur yeah. Currently, surprisingly enough, they don't talk about it a lot, but there is actually a different branch that is opening within oh. the Catholic church where they're bringing additional people in for some of these cases. Wow. And they believe that the vast majority of it, and this is all speculation, right? We're just, yeah, yeah. For funsies, I'm bringing this up. Right. Supposedly, it's because so many people are into the occult stuff now as gags. But the problem mm. is they're opening up things that they don't understand what they're opening and then they can't close them. Yeah, I've heard similar things. I'm, again, skeptical about that, but um, I have right. heard that to verify what you're saying. Another thing that I found interesting, and I just saw this, uh, actually, I just put a video out. I can't remember what channel I put it on, but I think I put it on mine. You know, Robert, the doll, obviously, right. Mm -hmm. Based out of, uh, uh, Florida. Right. And this goes back around to when people do dumb things. It just annoys me a little bit. This YouTube channel, two guys, I'm not going to say the name cause it kind of ticks me off a little bit. They went there and okay. did a blood sacrifice to Robert, the doll. Oh, that's just foolishness. Even if and you don't guess, believe, that's foolishness. Yeah, even if you don't believe, because how many people that does believe now, but supposedly they said, well, we started getting sick after that, and now they're doing the apology. So either A, they're doing it for ad revenue and nothing really happened, or right. you opened up something that you shouldn't have opened up. But at worst case scenario, then, you know, there becomes a line in the sand where it's like, don't cross that line, right? Yeah. 
And I think that for a lot of these create content creators, I would rather go into a place and be respectful than to try to provoke something. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This isn't the place, but I've got stories about that. Oh, I guarantee there's tons of stories. There's gotta be. I think what happened to these guys, bloodborne pathogen. Could be, you know, if anything happened at all, who knows? Because I bet, 70% 70% of most of these paranormal shows are mm-hmm. bull crap. Yeah. They're oh, not capturing anything. At least. At least. I think in all the videos I've ever seen, only mm. one was quite convincing to me. Wow. Yeah. But you found one. I did find one. Yep. And uh, I'll, I'll have to show it to you sometime and maybe we can do a little thing about it. There wasn't any story to it, though. It's just that they mm. happen to forget to tear down the cameras when they were doing something and they saw this thing and it was verified. There's no trickery and they don't know why it was there. It was just there. Do you ever watch uh, watcher? No, I don't think so. Uh, They do a show. I think it's called like ghost files and there's a skeptic, Mm -hmm. which is Shane Madey. Okay. And there is a believer. His name is Ryan. They've been doing this. They did it with um, BuzzFeed for a while. Okay. And uh, it was called Bud- BuzzFeed Unsolved. And their new show is Watcher. Yeah. I used to watch <laughs> BuzzFeed Unsolved all the time. Yeah. Yeah. The I love that. Hosts. I didn't know yeah. they continued on after. They did. They've got their own channel. They own the rights to it. It's called Watcher. Oh, I can't believe so, this. Yeah. Every single week they have an episode of a different haunted location they go to and their stuff is kind of believable because of course Shane goes, that's not a ghost it's wind or whatever. Right. And that's like an ongoing joke. He's not scared of anything, Yeah, but you got Ryan that's jumping around at every little yeah, thing. He, like that's a ghost. One of them provokes things. He likes to try to provoke things Shane. too. Yeah. Shane. That's Shane. Yeah. Yeah. I, that I definitely am, sounds like Shane. If you're listening, Jen, I can't believe you didn't tell me about this. You know, I love, <laughs> you know, I love this show. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't know. Oh, she knows. I know it. I'm accusing well, her right now. Yeah. The YouTube channel is watcher. Um, and yeah, once a week, they also do when they go to the, they do like, it's called the ghost files live. Okay. They'll go into like a major city where they're doing these things and they'll have like a, what we'll be doing one day, Nick, yeah. we'll be sitting down talking to the crowds. Any day now, any day now. Exactly. <laughs> Well, what I want to do is get your impression at the beginning of this bad boy. We know what the story is, but are you ready to right. hear the some of the beginning meat and potatoes? Yes, please. As the calendar pages flip to early 1949, the peculiar disturbances haunting the Doe family home took on a new, alarming character. Gone were the days when a mere scratch in the wall or a tapping sound could be brushed aside. Instead, the home was now a theater of bewildering phenomena that seemed almost orchestrated. A crescendo of events that left no room for skepticism, even among the most rational minds in the household. And it wasn't just objects or sounds that changed. Roland himself began to act in ways that could only be described as erratic. Extreme agitation, sudden mood swings, none of which aligned with the boy his family thought they knew. In moments of apparent calm, a veil of silence would descend, only to be shattered by Roland's outburst, which came without warning and without discernible triggers. It was as though some external force had wound him like a top, letting him spin out of control before abruptly halting him over and over again. It was at this juncture that the family was left with no choice but to accept a sobering truth what they were witnessing was not just a string of coincidences, but rather manifestations of something much greater and far more disturbing. The question now was not is something happening, but what is happening and how can it be stopped? By now, the household was a nexus of inexplicable events, but what came next would forever sear itself into the memories of all who were involved. Up to this point, the occurrences, though unsettling, had been external sounds, movements, objects acting against the laws of physics. But then the unimaginable happened. The phenomena became personal, taking a disturbingly physical form. Scratches and markings began to appear on Roland's body, manifesting before the very eyes of his horrified family. 
Lines and welts, with no source or reason, etched themselves onto his skin as if drawn by an invisible hand. As if this wasn't enough, furniture started to react to Roland's presence in ways that defied reason. Chairs toppled over, tables slid across the floor, and objects levitated in a defiance of gravity as though pulled by unseen strings. With each new incident, the family's concern escalated into a paralyzing fear accompanied by an oppressive atmosphere that weighed heavy on their spirits. No longer could they deny or rationalize what was happening. What they were facing was not merely strange or unexplained, it was malevolent. As physical manifestations continued to intensify, it became undeniably clear Roland Doe was no longer merely the center of these bewildering events. He had become the conduit, a focal point for something that neither science nor reason could explain. All right. So before we discuss it too much, I want to do a PSA. If, it, if you ever think that someone's possessed, and you're basing it just be on their behavior, not all these extra things, it's probably mental illness. You yes. need to look at these surrounding factors. And all this extra stuff, that's what makes this extraordinary, not that a kid has suddenly changed behaviors. That's the part I want to make clear. But all this other stuff, Correct. can't explain that. Correct. Like I say, whenever we talk about extras that come in, mm -hmm. their primary job is to say, this isn't, this isn't a possession. Right. And that's exactly what they did with Roland Doe. Mm -hmm. Their thought process is because uh, Roland was at an age where technically he would have been going through a few mood changes anyway. Right. Right. So the way that it looked to them when it first, and I'm looking here because I had a note on this. There was a point where one of the, there was two extras that came in. There was one guy that came in first and he, I forget what his actual name was, but I've got it in my notes, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to sift through it. Okay. When it was all said and done, he was like, okay, there's a little bit more here. And what, what made a huge change from the infield polar guys to this one, the biggest difference, mm -hmm. if you noticed, and I put this in the narration, when Roland would right. go in, mm -hmm. furniture would begin reacting to that. I did. That yeah, that was important. Eerily familiar to the infield polar guys. It, it does, but it seems like it's easier to tell that this isn't something he would be faking. Because they didn't right. find him in a room. He entered a room and it reacted. They mostly Correct. found the kids on the beds or what have you. So this is a little Correct. more convincing. Well, and uh, look, this is what I was looking for. In 1948 to early 1949 was when the initial unusual experiences occurred. Right. At that point... Roland Doe was 14 years old. Okay. So he's at an age where by default, the priest came in going, these are mood swings. Right. He's getting probably his first real taste of testosterone. Mm -hmm. He's going to have these mood swings. It's, that's common. Yeah. And that's how we want them coming into this. Yes. The first preach, uh, the the first preacher that came in was a Lutheran minister. Okay. And that was Reverend Schultz. Uh, or I'm sorry. The family reached out to the Lutheran minister because they were Lutheran. Right. Um, and it was Reverend Schultz. And then Schultz brought in the, basically Lutherans came in and they're like, this isn't our, this isn't our bang zone. You need to go to a Catholic church. So they turned to the Catholic church and they went to father E Albert Hughes at St. James church. Okay. And his first job was to come in and observe. Yeah. And this can go on for quite long. I understand the observation. Yes. Yes. And 
what made this real interesting and some of the things that I didn't know is how they figured out what truly was happening with Roland Doe. So the way that the narration gives is uh-huh. they have him at the house and they do this and they do that and they, they see what's there. That's not necessarily the case. Okay. Uh, they observe things because they also try to get him out of the house to see what would happen outside of the residence. Right. And what they found was things typically got better when they okay. was outside the house. Until one thing happened where the pastor took Roland to his own home mm-hmm. and the things started happening in his own home. And he goes, uh. Roland had no opportunity to create this in my house. And that's, he didn't say it, but he said, there's something up with this. The demon's got to get comfy. He's like, not, he gets performance anxiety when he's not settled into a location. So correct. <laughs> but the um, fact that he did his house, that's what's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Because if it was a haunted location or anything, that obviously wouldn't happen. Um, now another thing I wanted to bring up to the, uh, etchings in the skin and stuff appearing before people's eyes. So common. Like we hear that on so many stories. Yeah. And a lot of times what they say is that they're self-inflicted, but in this case, what made it compelling is the fact that they appeared on his back, which he could not replicate. Exactly. So, and a lot of times it was actually, um, either crosses or variations of sixes. Right. Now I'm going to tell a story. I had it in my notes. I'm going to tell a story that I didn't add to the narration because this is not, this is from an outside source that talked about the Lutheran pastor Mm -hmm. was what, which was Schultz when he was going to the Catholic church, he had to basically to expedite this thing. He had to tell them, This is what I saw. Right. So the Lutheran pastor Schultz basically told the family, listen, I want to make sure that this is legit for me to basically guarantee is I need to have this happen in my house. If this doesn't happen in my house, I won't go on the record for it. Basically. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Because he was friends, I believe, with someone in the Catholic Church, which is how the Catholic Church came in. Okay. So Schultz took Roland and he basically said, we're having a a boy's night. Mm. You're going to sleep in my bedroom in your own separate little like cot area. Okay. And I just want to see if there's going to be knocking and banging and stuff like that. I just want to see what's there. Right. So according to the notes... Everything seemed fine, but he noticed that things started to move in his house. And one of them was a lamp. Okay. Um, And the way that he figured it out was him and Roland was sitting and they was talking and they was talking about scripture. And the moment that he brought up scripture, right. he started hearing something. And out the corner of his eyes, it looked like the light was flickering. The light wasn't oh. flickering. It was bouncing on the table. Oh, interesting. Okay. So he went back over, put the lamp back where it was. Double check the cord. It was nowhere near Roland. Nowhere near. Right. He said that would have been enough for him, but that was just the, for the funsies. Right. That evening they get through everything. And he said, Roland seemed very nervous. He didn't want to go to sleep. The pastor's like, you're going to go to sleep. Then you're caught. We'll, we'll go through the night. And Roland said, I'm always scared because at nights it gets worse. It gets worse. And he goes, You're in the house of a pastor. This is God's house. That almost provoked whatever this demon was. That evening, the pastor woke up. And the way that he woke up was the cot or like the sleeping bag thing that Roland was in Mm -hmm. was slamming against the ground with Roland inside of it. Oh, really? Now, typically what ends up happening is he's like, He gets up and he's assuming maybe, you know, he's bouncing or something. So he goes, Roland, you're going to go and lay in the bed. 
Okay. You're going to lay in the bed. I'm going to watch from a distance, try to get some sleep. And Roland apparently is just at this point, he's distraught. Yeah. Well, can you he blame the down. poor kid? Oh, yeah, dude. I would have been like, yeah. nope. Yeah. This is also a strange location for him. So this is like this, this sucks. double whammy. In, yeah. Correct. Supposedly they went downstairs and he made him something is like maybe hot cocoa or something. He gets him mm-hmm. calm back down. Goes, he's got two beds in the room because his wife was slept in one bed and he slept in another bed. His wife was somewhere. I forget where his wife was, but okay. Roland's in one bed. He said he goes to the other bed. He turns out the lights. It was like however long later. And he says he's awake and he starts hearing the, the banging. Mm. Flips on the light and the bed is now banging up and down. Now, where does this sound familiar? Yeah, that's Enfield all over again. But I'm picturing Enfield sturdier beds here. For grown Correct. adults. So, yeah. Correct. Okay. So now he's like, he's he goes to the bed. He's trying to make sure that Roland's not doing anything. Mm. He tells Roland to go sit in a chair while he inspects the bed. While he's sitting on the chair, the chair spins around, drops Roland on the ground, mm. and is like bouncing him around. So the pastor's like, what is going on? So at this point, it's like two or three o'clock in the morning. Right. The pastor's, everything calms back down. He's like, Roland, listen, we got to make it through the night. You're fine. This is God's house. So yeah, it doesn't sound like God's home right now. Yeah. It sounds like he's trust out of and town. Believe. <laughs> trust and believe. So he makes Roland because everything that Roland would sit on. Mm-hmm. He would get thrown off of. So he's like the safest place for him to be is on the ground on that right. cot in the sleeping bag. He says he deliberately stays awake. And while he's awake, he hears this thud. As he turns on the light, he sees the sleeping bag going across the room and underneath the bed. Man, that's that he that's was terrifying. In previously. Yeah. And you can't fake that either. He said his, the Roland was screaming profusely. He had to pull the bed out to get Roland from underneath it. He said that from then on, basically, he, he was 100% that you cannot make this stuff up. Right. So he goes to Catholic Church, and they're like running him through this stuff. And he goes, listen, this happened in my house. I watched this happen firsthand. That's how the Catholic Church came in. So I wish they filmed the Catholic- this. I just want to say oh, that. I, I wish they'd film this stuff. Supposedly, suppose, well, this is 1940-something, so it wasn't yeah. relevant to have that kind of stuff. Supposedly, there was audio files, though. Okay. I cannot ever, I've never been able to find it. Yeah. But well, you said earlier they didn't release most of this. Re- now, supposedly, and I mean supposedly, there's audio files somewhere, but... Again, this was the 1940s, so I don't think that, mm-hmm. well, for one, they wasn't going to bring it out, right? No. Like they're not going to bring it into the, the attention of anybody. But the fact that there was audio files, I would pay all kinds of money to get my hands on those bad boys. <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I think they're there's editing one exorcism. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Well, there's one exorcism that, uh, what was it, Emily Rose, where the actual mm-hmm. audio files was released. I think it was yeah. Emily Rose, right? I think so. I remember yeah, that. I'm pretty sure. But think about it. This is probably what I would consider the 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 grand exorcist story, so right. to speak. Like this is what originated the fascination, I think, for a lot of this stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's been a thing forever, but this brought it to the mainstream, I think. Oh yeah, big time. I mean, you know, we talked about this once before. You know, all these exorcisms was happening before then. Mm-hmm. And I actually, I just, I was looking at this case the other day and, uh, golly, what was the name of that? Anyway, it was one where the woman died and then the pastors went to court. Mm-hmm. The parents went to court because they said she was malnutritioned. This was, uh, Annalise. Annalise it. was it? Yeah. Annalise. You're dead yeah. on the money. Yeah. Yep. I couldn't yep. think of the name of it, but it's Annalise. Yeah. And uh, I think they was all acquitted, but it was wild that they actually took them. To, I mean, they went to court for child endangerment, uh, yeah. child endangerment, as well as 
they, there was something else. It wasn't attempted murder or murder. It no, was I, I think it was else. like negligence or manslaughter negligence, or something yeah. like that. That's what it was. Um, but that was like the first like well-known exorcism is fake. They hmm. killed this girl kind of case, which was interesting. But this is like where the exorcisms really kind of took main stage, I guess is oh, yeah. probably the best way to put it. So we obviously dug into the, the pastor and how he went to the house. Now, one interesting right. thing is, and what I was actually, the direction I was going to go, Catholic church comes in. They heard all the stories. The fascinating thing is unlike the infill, when the, when the people came in, it kind of regressed a little bit. Right. This has to be not, did not regress in this one. Mm. Catholic, Catholic pastor comes in instantaneously. There's the writing on the skin, but the pastor's watching it as it's moving across his skin. Right. Now think about it as a parent, your child is going through this. You're watching it. Think about the traumatic thought, like, Oh, helpless. When one of my kids get sick now, oh, it's so hopeless. Right. Like the frustrating part for me right now, as it, as some of you may know, some of oh. you will not know, I have a very young child. When she's sick, she does not have a vocabulary enough to explain what's going on. Mm. So it's frustrating for me because it's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix this situation because I don't know, like, you know, the obvious things, like if she's got a right. fever, but like, here's a great example. Like the other day she was screaming and I couldn't figure out what mm. was up. I didn't know if she bit her tongue. If there's a tooth that maybe, you know, she bit down on something right. uh, like the side of her mouth. I didn't know mm. if she was just screaming to scream because something else hurt because a lot of times when they're in pain, Right. They can't explain where that pain's at. So you got to kind of dig it out. It's a struggle for adults sometimes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But think about it. The, you get that little bit of, I don't know what to do. Now, this mm. is a parent that's watching it. They can clearly have a conversation with their son, but in the same regard, they're like, right. I don't know how to fix this. Right. They're looking at this pastor. And to a degree, they said when the pastor got there, it almost increased. Right. How hard this was. So it's like. That's defiance. Be, oh, yeah. It'd be like That's bringing a doctor, you know, taking your kid to the doctor. And then the moment they step in the doctor's office, it gets worse. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, do I take them back out of here to make the situation better? Or right. do, like, here's a, then another what? great example. Another great example. When I was young, I have very small ear canals, which unfortunately I've cursed all of my children with also. They had to put tubes okay. in my ears, mm -hmm. but I've chronically had ear infections chronically. Right. Oh, those hurt. Oh, it was horrible when I was a kid. Like I remember mm. the pain from those and it was just, it was excruciating. We went to the doctor and at one point they're like, he's got a buildup of wax. They put this cleaning solution in my ear, which apparently had an allergic reaction. And oh, I got geez. very sick, like mm. very sick. My parents took me and we, where I lived, it was like a 40 minute hour drive to go to the, to the ear doctor. Right. Then they took me there just for a checkup for the tubes. And that cleaning solution did something on the way home. Mm -hmm. I was, they said I was acting in a way that I'd never acted before. They end up driving me back to the doctor's office. Like, we don't know what you did, but we need to fix this. Right. And I remember the lady that was there, I think it was the lady or the doctor, one of the two, they was like, he's just, you know, pretending. pretending. And I remember, my, yeah, basically I was like, I was making it a bigger deal than what it was. My parents is like, he does not act like that. Like that is mm. not how he is. I remember this conversation. Oh, you were clearly it, possessed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would have dropped you off at the church. I'd be like, okay, church doorstep, here you go. <laughs> if only they could, Nick, they probably would have. <laughs> they probably would have. But they ended up looking in my ear and they're like, oh my God, yeah, no, that something did happen. Mm. But it's like, 
I have to think back to that situation where it's like, even the yeah. doctor's like, no, he's just pretending to get attention or whatever. Right. Mm. Like if you're the church and you're coming in, you're like, okay, is this a, is this real? Then you see it. The parents are like, this is getting worse now because we brought this, we potentially brought this thing in that made this situation worse for our son. That's 14 right. years old. You know, it's a very hopeless feeling. I could only mm. assume what these parents felt. I was moment. thinking helpless, like you're helpless sure. to do anything. Like that oh, would be a sure. terrible feeling. Terrible. Like I always said, if I had a choice between me and my kids, let it be me. Oh, yeah. Let let me deal with whatever the consequences is or whatever the thing is. Don't let my kids experience it. You know what? You this know? is could probably going to sound weird for me because mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of kids. But if there was a choice between something happening to any kid or sure. myself, I'd prefer it to happen to me. Oh, for sure. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Like, I, I mean, like, uh, like, I'm not a fan of them, but I've had a lot more life than they've had at that point. So it's strictly sure. a fairness issue. Oh, for Gotta sure. Gotta be fair. Yeah. I think that that's always going to be the way that most of our minds think. Hmm. Well, if you're a good person, if you're a bad person, you're probably not thinking that way, you weirdos. <laughs> God. Yeah, weirdos. <laughs> but it was interesting that the Catholic Church came in, the pastor comes in, and then all this stuff starts happening. He's like, okay, yeah, no, okay. The Lutheran yeah. pastor knew what was going on. <laughs> yeah. Surprise, <It's> surprise. <laughs> exactly. Who would have thought? You ready to go to the next segment, Nick? Yeah, let's hear a little more here. We're going we're gonna to take a captivating ride. Desperation breeds drastic measures, and for the Doe family, the spiraling events left them grasping for any means of understanding. Armed with a mix of curiosity and dread, they decided to embark on a perilous course direct communication with the unknown force that had taken over their lives. Simple tests were devised, as rudimentary as they were daring. Questions asked into the void of their own home, answered not with voices but with actions, objects moving, writings appearing. As each question was posited, the manifestation seemed to respond, as though a dialogue had been opened. But this was no ordinary conversation, and with each interaction, the activities around Roland intensified, growing more frenetic and alarming. It was as if the act of communication itself had given the entity greater access, or worse, permission. Though they had sought answers, the family found only more questions. Their attempt to converse had not led to understanding, but instead had fanned the flames of activity into an inferno of supernatural phenomena. Clearly, the Doe family had crossed a threshold beyond which lay a realm they could neither understand nor control. They were now participants in a drama far greater and darker than anything they could have conceived, a tale written not by them but for them by an unseen hand. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to engage in conversation or challenges Correct. for, for the devils. But it reminds me a lot of the infield poltergeist because they encourage that also. It's almost yep. like these stories could almost piggyback off of each other. Well, I think a lot of them follow the same format like we were talking about in the beginning. I think there's a routine they got to go through for whatever reason. And, you know, we just play a lot into it because who, who isn't going to want to ask questions to a supernatural entity? Me? <laughs> oh, no. I'd, I'd be, like, sitting there uh, making them lay down on a psychiatrist's couch and asking all kinds of questions. That's deep right there, Nick. That's deep. Yeah. Yeah, I want to see what makes them bad. Why can't they be good? <laughs> One interesting thing that's not in that narrative. Mm -hmm. I closed my notes, so I'm not. I think this is around the time frame. I'm going to shoot off the hip. If someone knows okay. the story better than me and they've read that book, I apologize. If my notes was open, I would know better. But around this time frame, I believe Roland went to the hospital. Okay. Supposedly, with all the writing that was happening on him personally, mm -hmm. he was losing, losing blood similar to like a stigmata kind of situation. Right, right. 
they wanted to make sure the Catholic church is like, we need to make sure that this is safe Mm. because there's a lot of stuff going on. We want to make sure that there's not something that's going to cause us to get in trouble, basically. Well, this is what I'm wondering Mm -hmm. because nowadays, if you take a kid in with a right in on him, you're going to be in jail so quick. Oh, for sure. That your head will spin. Supposedly, this is from the skeptics account. Right. That was never an issue because 1940s. Yeah. So you got to remember the time frame was significantly different than now. Yeah. They're still prescribing cigarettes to pregnant ladies to calm them down Pretty and much. stuff. Oh, that's Pretty a real much. thing, man. That's a real thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, for <laughs> sure. Now, what's interesting is the skeptic said that Roland wasn't there because of any of that stuff. Right. But there was a hospital record of Roland being, Roland being checked in. Okay. But they're saying that it wasn't due to the stigmata stuff. But they can't tell us what it was because it didn't really say. Right. Now, if I'm a hospital, someone wheels in this kid and goes, Hey, they're uh, potentially demon infested. Don't know that you can quite put that in the notes. No, I I don't think they would under any circumstance. I don't <laughs> no. think they'd believe it. Correct. Well, it's 1940s. I bet they there would be a series of people that did. Right, but they're still at work in a place where there's probably more skeptics than anywhere else you'd go to. Oh, I, I would agree with that. You're probably right. On yeah. You're, yeah. You're probably right yeah. on that. You can't put that on official documents anyway. They're not, they're just not going to put that on an intake form. No, but I found it amazing that skeptic did say there was a hospital mm-hmm. visit and he definitely yep. checked in, but we highly refuse to accept the fact that it was due to the stigma or the uh, stigmata. Yeah, it was a stigmata or the right. writing on the skin. And apparently yeah. the writing on the skin was just deep enough to draw blood okay. and it would cause welts. But what was interesting was when it would go away, it was as though it was never there. Okay. So, well, I guess it wouldn't scar in if it was just shallow, like cat scratches or something. I mean, I've got some, that I wouldn't think would still be there, but they are. I guess it depends. Well, what causes a scar or doesn't cause a scar is basically how jagged the wound is. Yeah, that's true. So, so it wasn't it jagged. Listen, they was using the good blades. <laughs> yeah. So that, I mean, if, if anything, that's more proof to the believer's side than the skeptic side. I would agree with that. I mean, it would make logical sense. Yeah, I would think so. If it was fingernails or something like that, I don't yeah. think that it would draw blood. No, and that would be a jagged edge. It. Yeah, I would assume yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's very interesting, the whole thought process of how that, because I've seen, first off, I've seen videos where that happens, and I still don't believe mm-hmm. any of them. I've never seen where, one where I'm like, yep, yeah, that's legit. Yeah. Um, Nowadays, I find videos hard to believe anything anyway. Oh, yeah. There's, man. I I need to see something in person, and the odds of that are so slim. Um, It's I don't get I don't get invited to nearly the amount of exorcisms I would like to. (laughs) I think there's so much CGI. Yeah. Um, Somewhat off topic, but mostly on topic. Unless it's something that it wasn't meant to be recorded, but it was recorded, I go, hmm. Right. Like there was on our official channel the other day, I posted a, I don't know if you saw it or not, the news where they're talking about the smog and the woman's like, this is layer smog right here and mm. blah, 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 blah. And as she's doing it, there's a silver orb going across the sky. Right. And she points up and she goes, what's that? And it's Telemundo TV. So it's like... Mm. I didn't understand a single word they said, but basically you could tell they was like, is that a UFO basically? But you know, like that wasn't intended to be that way. That's yeah. the only way I typically believe videos anymore. I, I don't know. Even that's not enough for me. I don't think I would accept video evidence for the most part. 
not today. Definitely yeah, that not was pictures. like a news channel. That was a news yeah. channel of an outside TV feed. I don't believe news at all anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no. Next no, I'm, 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 I'm skeptical because that was probably, <sighs> I don't know. Telemundo has been, it, was it actually Telemundo? Uh, is one of those channels. Okay. Like Cause it, Telemundo footage has been the subject of a number of controversies in the past anyway. So I, this was like a, uh, I don't think it was Telemundo. I think it yeah. was, uh, it said on our thing, but it was one of those to where they was like, it was like a weather thing. It was yeah. like two anchors talking about weather. It was, I'm going to butcher this, Nick. I was not made <laughs> to say some of these. So this one was a recent episode of Mananas Argentinas. Oh, okay. Yeah. M A N with the little fancy thing. Yeah. A N A S. Mananas. Mananas. It's probably manana. I don't I don't know. But I don't know. um e- either way, for me personally, and maybe this is just a personal thing, I can't accept video evidence. Not at this point, and knowing how easy it is to fake. Well, this was in Buenos Aires, mm. Argentina, so I don't know. Oh, they're super skilled with computers. <laughs> We're not I don't care Nick where on they this are. One, boys and girls. Yeah, I'm, I'm not buying it. I'm not accepting <laughs> this video evidence. You you I can convince it, me, but you don't need a video to do it. You're gonna have to do it a different way. Audio yeah. files, baby. That's the way Nick does them now. Yeah. It, if you just talk me into it, that's how to win me over. I see it now. Nick and I is gonna do like this ghost tour. I'm gonna be like, Nick, look at this video footage. You're gonna be like, I don't believe it. I don't look at videos. <laughs> I know you and your CGI. <laughs> yeah, you did it when I wasn't looking. <laughs> oh man, it's it's pretty interesting though that this yeah. case it follows the infield. I was amazed with how much mm-hmm. it followed the infield Porter guys case. Yeah, they they do. The, they seem to. But the fact that they try to communicate, stop doing that. Uh, don't, don't do it. Don't ah, do it. These people annoy me almost. It ticks me off so bad. Listen, if they didn't do that, we wouldn't be talking about it. That is true. Valid. So do it. Maybe keep doing it. We need episodes. <laughs> yeah. Do, do it more. Do it more. Do it a little bit more. Just a little bit. Don't be rude. Strike up a conversation with your devils today. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. All right. You ready to go to the next segment? Nick? Yeah. That, I, I, I'm loving this. So feed me more, please. <laughs> Let's go. As weeks stretched into months, the mounting tension in the Doe household reached a breaking point. No longer able to endure the relentless series of mysterious events and having exhausted all other avenues of explanation, the family found themselves considering options they had never before thought possible. It was at this juncture that they turned to spiritual advisors, hoping to find some form of respite or at the very least, understanding in faith The clergy who were consulted were initially skeptical, as any person grounded in reason would be, but even they couldn't ignore the barrage of evidence presented by the family. Physical marks, eyewitness accounts, the sheer emotional toll, skeptical minds gave way to committed action. Religious rites were considered, prayers were intoned, and holy artifacts were introduced into the home in an effort to quell the disturbances. But, as if to challenge these acts of faith, the phenomena responded with equal force, almost as if taunting those who sought to intervene. Despite these setbacks, the spiritual advisors remained steadfast, because what had begun as a series of inexplicable events had transformed into a struggle not just for understanding, but for the very soul of Roland Doe. The engagement of spiritual advisors marked a crucial phase in this bewildering tale, for it acknowledged that what the family faced was beyond mere superstition or psychology. They were now in the realm of the spiritual, a battle of unseen forces that defied not just their understanding, but perhaps the understanding of us all. We're building to a climactic battle, I can tell. That's exactly why that segment was in there. So it reiterated the fact that the Catholic Church is in. Catholic Church came in and they was like, all right, typically the first thing that we need to do is add these artifacts. That's going to bless and lock everything in place so we can begin this process. And almost as soon as they do it, bam, gets way more aggressive. 
Yeah. Which is not uncommon. Whenever I nope. see these demonic cases, it's crazy how aggressive they get. Yeah. It's an act of occurs. defiance. Like Correct. they want to throw things in the face of the re- religion and, and Jesus and God and that kind of thing. Like they're the enemy. So they, they, which I always find interesting as mm-hmm. someone who's an agnostic, right. how do you view that Nick? Because I mean, clearly um, you don't necessarily not believe, but you don't necessarily believe either. So if it wasn't mm-hmm. real, why would it do that? Well, okay, let's get into hypotheticals now. Cause yep. and just to reiterate, agnostic mean meaning I don't know and I don't think that I can know. Sure. But no one can know. Um could be a variety of reasons, could be a coincidence, could be because those things just annoy him. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're ghost aliens and they're getting tired of these uh old artifacts being brought in and shook at them. Um, you know, maybe it's the psychology of the people that are having this situation that they think that these are the things that should annoy an entity and they act it out. There's tons of reasons, but I'm also not going to take out the fact that this could be a biblical demon who is in a biblical war with Christianity. So it could be any number of things. All I I can say is I think something's going on or I think there's not. I said Uh something the other day that Mm -hmm. completely shocked somebody. Okay. Because again, I always say as a believer, they were so shocked that these words came out of my mouth. We was talking about a similar, this kind of similar, you know, possession, blah, 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 blah. Right. This person's not a believer, by the way. And he said, if you had to put all your money and you could not say, you could not say that the Bible was true and all this stuff was true. If, Mm -hmm. if that was off the table and you had to say what all this stuff is, what, what would you say? That's why I ask you the question I asked you, because I was trying to understand the mindset. Right. Mm -hmm. I said, all my money's like, this is like the roulette table. All my number, all my money's on black or red. That's what you're asking me. Mm -hmm. Yes. I said, I would not doubt if we live in a simulation. Okay. And he said, why would you of all the, like, if you don't believe in the Bible, why would you think it's a simulation? I said, technically, just because you believe in the Bible and stuff like that, we could still be in a simulation. Mm -hmm. I said, what if, and this, I've never heard anyone ever say this before. I'm assuming I'm not the only person that's ever came up with this idea, but what if you're a believer and your simulation goes the way that it's supposed to, you're Mm -hmm. an atheist. And at the end of your program protocol, you don't exist anymore. Right. What if you believe in Bigfoot and then you go out and what do you discover? Bigfoot. Right. And then he, he, I mean, kudos to him. He said, well, what about the people that don't believe? And then they do believe. I said, it doesn't mean that two parallel simulations cannot hit each other. Right. And he said, I never would have thought out of your mouth, you would have ever said something would be a simulation. And I said, well, we don't know. I said, that's half the fun of this Mm. thing. That's, this is why we have these conversations, you know, but in the same regard, it's like, if, if this is what I'm to believe, like I've, I've seen it time and time again, I've had miracles happen to me that no one can tell me that they did not happen. They'll never be able to tell me if you said we will kill you you have to explain what happened. And if you're off an iota, I can explain the situations like the back of my hand. Exactly. Mm-hmm. What the heck is that? Um, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I thought a spider was on you. <laughs> no, I was like, just like the back of my hand. Oh my gosh. What's that? Um, 
but I've had experiences that I know most people would never believe, but I've seen them firsthand and I know right. that they exist. Mm-hmm. But is that my simulation working in the background? Well, the, the nature of reality is difficult to pin down. We could all be experiencing different things, just like you said. Our simulations could collide sometimes. They could be intensely personal sometimes. Oh, for sure. When you and, and I are talking, I th- we could have a completely different worlds going on until we talk Correct. again. What if there was multiple simulations, which we know as dimensions, and those mm-hmm. dimensions overlap from time to time? Could be very We had likely. a computer situation, a computer glitch not that long ago. I believe it was due to a window being opened. Mm. Should it have affected this situation? No, but it did. Uh, it sure that did. Was two, <laughs> two simulations occurring back to back. Right. One I didn't know existed. Mm. Once we closed that window, no problems. Yeah. How many times that's, do you see weird. glitches in what they call the matrix and you go, well, that's weird. I believe that if you're not looking for something to happen, maybe your simulation, it doesn't happen. <laughs> Maybe that's why there's certain rules put in place. One of which I think about it all the time. What if in your, in your thought process, you're like, this cannot happen Mm -hmm. and it just flat out doesn't happen. So in this case, they're religious people. Anything that's within the rules, almost like a board game. If the board game says this can Mm -hmm. happen, it can happen. Right. Why not? Maybe there's not an answer for it. We don't know. You better watch yourself. You're in danger of becoming an agnostic. (laughs) You're in danger, boy. (laughs) No, because here's the way I look at it. Right. If what I'm saying is correct and I'm, I Mm -hmm. am in a simulation, right. My simulation will continue. But what if you're Buddhist and you believe in reincarnation? Maybe in their simulation, that is how they live their life. I've seen cases yeah. of reincarnation where I'm go, that doesn't make any sense, but there's a story that I can't explain either. Now, where I come from, that's not necessarily true. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. But there's stories that I can't answer. What if their simulation allows that to occur? Well, I mean, there could be infinitely splitting timelines that, you're changing realities by the moment. When oh, yeah. You the Sims. take a step to the left or to the right, it could split off into different realities, you know? We don't know that. The Sims is a great example. I've been playing The Sims since the 90s, late 90s. Yeah. Or maybe it's 2000s when it came out. It was a long time ago. Those Sims, it's not programmed in. It's you control certain Mm -hmm. things, but based on what you control is what happens. Video games have came so far. What if some of the things that occur, like our sense of gravity, all these things are just code. Could very well be. Could all be code. Why is, why is it maybe the, we can never get beyond quote unquote, according to, to Einstein, this we can never go above the speed of light. What if that's because that's the fastest our CPU will allow? Could very well be. It's how, interesting how could to think. You, know? you don't know. How, how could you know what's behind the curtain of reality? How, how could you know? You can't. You can't. You can't. That's why all these stories are plausible. Right. Except for the Bigfoot story you, we did a couple episodes ago. <laughs> yeah, not plausible. Not plausible. <laughs> sorry, sorry. But, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's like everything else. It's like, where is the line at? And in this case, right. like, the story's so good, and there's so many different things. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's why I look at you as an agnostic, and I go, how do you justify it? If they're bringing in all these religious artifacts and all of a sudden this thing mm-hmm. goes crazy, that tells me there's a reason now. Is that because it's a simulation and that's what their simulation is? Like that Betrayal. would be my answer. If, if I was agnostic, I'd be like, this explains it because it's based on that simulation. What if but belief- to anyone else, you got to have the belief. Yeah. 
Yeah. What what if belief is something that you can build a certain quantity of? Like maybe imagine a light and the light's brighter if you believe more and it's dimmer if you believe less. And it doesn't matter at all what you believe. But when you do things to increase your belief, the light gets brighter. And that's a fact. And maybe it could hurt someone's eyes. Like they could believe in frogs Good. and bring in 200 stuffed frogs and the thing's going to be like, I hate this. You know? It could be. <laughs> Too could much belief be. in this room. I don't like it. That's what I'm saying. There's there's yeah. something to it. These stories, we've not had most, most of these stories I've been like, I can understand some plausibility to it. But it always circles me back around to simulation. I don't know why that is, but it always does. Does it make anyone's belief? And if anything, it means you can believe what you want to believe. Mm. And that's truly what happens. So nothing's right. technically wrong. I mean, that's kind of sacrilegious from my side. But you know what I'm saying? Like, no one knows. Yeah. No matter what you believe, it's faith. If you're an atheist, that's a, a faith. You have faith. Of X, Y, and Z. Mm. But you don't have proof. No one has proof. Like, no, Well, you can't prove a negative anyway. It's impossible. Correct. So Correct. There you go, right? I just saw it the other day, and I've not verified this, so don't hold me to it. Mm -hmm. Saber-toothed tigers. They think they found a saber-toothed tiger. Oh, yeah, I believe that. That's not far-fetched in my mind. They thought that it's been extinct for all these years, but... A researcher had found a track and mm -hmm. supposedly there's a video footage, that, but it's super grainy. And they believe that it is a legit saber tooth tiger that somehow has lived mm -hmm. all this time, which means there's more than one. Obviously, it, can't, <laughs> it wasn't a it's just that one Jesus really old moment. one. <laughs> yeah, there was not that or a star didn't come back down and form a little saber tooth tiger. You know what I mean? Yeah. But interesting. It's all interesting. I don't know. Whenever I see stories like this where I'm like, it takes such an extreme direction like this, I would throw mm. into a, this is proof of a religion. But in the same regard, yeah. it's like, you don't have to believe that. Yeah. But it's well, very have you heard interesting. Of tulpas. Tulpas? Tulpas. Yeah. Mm -mm. These are things created by belief. Like belief brings these things into existence. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's something we should cover sometime because I think we'd have a lot to say about that. This is why Nick is here, folks. He knows cool things that I don't know occasionally. <laughs> I am an evil wizard. <laughs> <laughs> so the basics of this story is now they're going back at it, Nick. They're basically getting ready to fight this battle. It's right. Battle Royale. That's what I'm going to call this. If it was the WWE in this corner, Roland Doe. Weighing in is 96 and a half pounds. I'm going, I'm going someplace I shouldn't go. <laughs> but uh, they're getting ready to go into the epic battle of a lifetime. And anyone that, that has not seen The Exorcist, it's nothing like the movie portrayed. Right. Though still bad. He was still thrashing around, was in excruciating pain. Uh, the interesting thing is in the movie, I didn't know this, in the actual movie, there's a spot. And for anyone that doesn't know, there's a young girl that plays it instead of a boy. But did you know she broke her back in that movie? Uh, it was the mother who broke her back when they mm -hmm. pulled her against the wall. Well, she also broke her back then. Oh, maybe. I don't know. We're, we'll have to check on ourselves after. Yeah, she broke her back because they had her strapped to a board when she was doing that plopping thing in the bed. Oh, okay. The strap released and it smacked her in the back and it either fractured her spine oh. or it broke a section of her spine. And when she's crying in the film, they thought she was just dramatically acting. No, they thought they was going to have to stop the movie and then she agreed mm. to continue on after they did whatever it was. Oh. 
I think you might be right. That sounds better than the story I was thinking of in my head. <laughs> I just saw I, when I was doing research, that's the only I yeah. watched or I didn't watch the movie, but I read a thing on the movie because I want to see how much of it was the same as, as the uh, real story. I didn't see anything about the mom. It doesn't mean that it didn't exist though. I, I think you might be right, but there's a certain point where she gets thrown against the dresser and they use mm. ropes to pull her backwards. And I had heard that that's what had happened, but I think your story might be right. Thank goodness I was not around and was not in movies back then because <laughs> they were a little bit more dangerous than they who, are now. Who wants their back broke? <laughs> exactly. That's not good. Don't want my back broke for a movie, folks. Just no. don't. Not today. Yeah, I'm not going to go into work and get my back broke to help some security checks or something. I <laughs> No. Negative, Ghost Rider. You got any questions so far, Nick, or you want to go to the next segment? We're getting to the uh, meat bring and potatoes. Me to the then. battle. I want to see the battle. Well, you're going to be sadly disappointed, I think, Nick. But uh oh, <laughs> here we well, go. I don't like to hear that. <laughs> In a story where the boundary between the natural and the supernatural had been increasingly blurred, the Doe family and their spiritual advisors reached a decision. A line had to be drawn. A stand had to be taken. It was time for an exorcism. With an air of solemnity, the appointed ministers prepared for a ritual as old as the faith itself, yet startlingly new for all involved. This was not a step taken lightly, for an exorcism is the most direct challenge one can pose to an intrusive entity. As the ritual commenced, the atmosphere within the household became palpable. Witnesses later described a tension so thick it was as if the air itself had become a medium for the struggle between unseen forces. Throughout the proceedings, Roland's behavior fluctuated wildly, at times serene, at others violently reactive, almost as though the entity within him was battling for control, not willing to relinquish its hold without a fight. And then, just as suddenly as it had all begun months ago, it was over. Silence descended on the household, whether through the potency of the right, the determination of the spiritual advisors, or some other unknowable factor, the entity was expelled. In the aftermath, those who had been part of this extraordinary chapter were left to ponder its implications. Had they witnessed a genuine supernatural phenomenon, or was it a complex web of psychological and environmental factors? Regardless, their lives would never be the same. That devil's a wimp. <laughs> that was not a climactic battle. <laughs> no, you know when I when I built this audio file for this thing, mm -hmm. I wanted that to be that big gruesome demon sound, and then cut yeah. away from every music, everything, because that was literally what happened. It was like a light switch was turned off. I think your soundscaping was probably more dramatic than what actually happened there. Maybe a guy in a black robe comes in and he's like, get <laughs> and the team is like, all right, all right, man. I don't want any trouble. Good enough. Less than I. Yeah. I did I. what I came to do. <laughs> it was very interesting that it was like this epic battle of basically who's going to win domination. And the other right. thing that I found interesting these Catholic priests came there. In the movie, it's almost like they were specialists. Right. They gave this impression. It's like, I've got all these 25 different things I'm going to lay out. And that's not what happened. Mm. Like they put artifacts out. Yeah. And they were doing what they were taught, but they were not well versed in exorcisms. Right. They just knew enough for this to work. So were these like local guys? It like they didn't, didn't send say, someone from the Vatican or no, it did not okay. say, but my guess is it probably was not specialists. Yeah. They did not they, give me that impression it. at all. They did it, I guess. Correct. Now what I find interesting about this story and we didn't know until this gentleman passed away. Mm-hmm. He lived a completely normal life, never had another thing occur, and went back to exactly who he was after that situation. And, and that's another kind of proof, I guess. 
Really? Everything went back completely to normal. Hmm. They said that his teenage years was typical teenage years. Like he would Mm -hmm. get angry about stuff. But for the most part, they said he was a laid back kid. He just didn't. Yeah. He went on, had his entire life. He worked a nine to five job. He was a, uh, he was in, he was a laborer. He didn't have any like specialized positions, but lived his entire life, had a family as though nothing happened. I've got some hard hitting questions for you that I don't think you'll have the answers to. Maybe, maybe not. I closed my notes, but we'll see. No, I don't think you're going to know this. Okay. Do you think he picked up the book, The Exorcist, and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, this this is suspicious, and then maybe he lets that go, and do you think he sat down to the movie, The Exorcist, and was like, well, hold on now, what's going on here? This is familiar. <laughs> I don't know the answers to that. Uh, I I didn't think you would. But if I'm him, the the skeptic said it that wrote the book as well as I've read it elsewhere. There was a lot of things that was exaggerated for sure in the movie, like the pea soup, blah, blah, blah. Never happened. None of that was even close to happening. I I feel like Uh, he knew that this was based on him, though. Oh yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah, he knew. Yeah, yeah, he definitely he been knew that part. Kickbacks, <laughs> something like he should get a percentage. Something. Yeah. But the amazing parts that I found, like movies, are cool from the scary stance of, oh, okay, yeah, look, it was vomiting this blah blah blah. Mm. That's scary, but it's like projectile vomiting seeing a kid levitate off a bed, which did happen yeah. or watching a kid get pulled across the floor of my house and underneath my bed. That's almost scarier than watching a kid projectile vomiting green vomit. But for movies, I understand why they did what they did. Yeah. I, I think the scariest thing to me in these scenarios is imagining living in a state where you don't know what's happening next. You don't know how many hours of sleep you're going to get. You don't know what terrifying things happening to you or your loved ones. And this is like ever present threat that could happen at any moment. And that terrifies me. See, to a degree, I've experienced a little bit of that side, a little Mm. bit. I've had, I've had at least, I don't know. I would say at least 30 or 40 experiences that I can point to and go, I know that happened. I think I know why that happened. Mm. And I don't know how to stop that from happening. But as I got older, I figured out how to control those experiences, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's kind of hard to explain, I guess, without going into narratives that people can understand a little bit. It's like I'm being very vague, but I'm doing it on purpose. Right. But, so, but in contrast, a kid is not going to know how to do any of that. No. Um, and, and perfectly normal parents wouldn't know how to deal with that. Correct. Like, here's a great example. I can give you one example. hmm Without feeling weird about it. Okay. So... From a very youngish age, I, I've been able to acknowledge things, hear things, know things that I probably shouldn't know, see, or hear. Mm. And best example, and I could call my wife down right now. She could tell you the same exact story. Have I told this story? I can't remember. But uh, if I have, I, I apologize. Think- not not on the podcast, I'm sure of it, but. So we decided to go on vacation one year. And when we went on vacation, we wanted to go on a ghost hunt, like mm-hmm. a little ghost tour thing. That's where they take you around all these little places. They tell you the history of the locations and blah, yeah. blah, blah. Ghost walks cool. normally, I think. Ghost walks, They would call yeah. that, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
That's what it was. And it was really cool. I was super excited about it because it was in Wilmington. I was super sad uh-huh. for a little bit because I was like, man, it's going to rain. And if it rains, it's going to destroy this entire trip. Like we we're looking yeah. around for like ponchos and stuff like that. Right. It didn't end up raining. I think it may have rained a little bit, but not like too bad. Yeah. But we're doing this tour and we're walking around historical Wilmington and I'm taking pictures of things and I'm like super into the history. Now I know when I'm about to have an experience because there's certain things that it's, it's very hard to explain because I don't even understand what's happening. But anyway, Mm. we're on this tour or on this ghost walk, whatever we're going towards a building and I start getting deathly sick, like super sick. And I tell Jess, I said, just go up, you know, go a little ahead of me and, Mm-hmm. I kind of sit back, I lean back and I'm trying, cause I don't want to yak on this thing. Right. I'm sitting oh, there yeah. thinking like, what did I eat? Like what's going on and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And then the, the tour guide that's explaining all the history and stuff. He acknowledges me leaning back a little bit and he goes, is he good? And the, the moral of the story was he acknowledged the fact that I got sick and he was looking for it. Right. And it, he said, people that are sensitive they get sick here. And the reason for that is Wilmington is a coast town. Okay. If you was on a boat and you was caught as a pirate, they would bring you into Wilmington and they would hang you at gallows that used to be at that location. Oh yeah. So I got real sick and he said, once we get very far, you're going to be completely fine. And I'm feeling this like, I'm not going to be fine. Yeah, Whatever this is, yeah. we get 50 yards away, completely fine. Mm-hmm. Not sick anymore. None of that. I can tell you another experience, one more, and I'll leave it at that for now. I got plenty okay. of these stories, but my grandmother passed away. Very traumatic time for me. Mm-hmm. I had a tough time with it. End up moving out of my parents and I moved into an apartment with my best friend. Right. Buddy of mine, known him for years. And one thing that my grandma got me, it didn't get me, it was something I got after she passed away. It was a little plate, right. like a little saucer thing. Yeah. Had like little flowers on and stuff like that. And I always kept it on a little table that I had. Mm-hmm. And one evening I felt what I can only describe as my grandma in that room. And I'm having a conversation. That's not a conversation. Right. It's almost like it's telepathically is the best way I can explain it because I'm thinking what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And it's responding in my head, which that's the first sign of, all right, I got some mental issues going on. Right. (laughs) But in my head, it was justified. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I'm sitting there and I'm like, maybe what I'm, but then the religious part of me goes, what if this is a demon? Hmm. And because what do they do? They always come to you as a comforting person, like a small child or a relative or whatever, right? It's never of some pod, like they're not going to come and be like, "I'm a demon." Like they're never going to do that, right? <laughs> and I remember challenging whatever it was, and that plate that was sitting on that little is like a little saucer thing. It's very small. Mm-hmm. Flew off my table, and I watched it fly off the table. Oh, wow. And that was a moment that I lean back and I go, I saw that happen. I know it happened. And it was right after I challenged the fact that it wasn't my grandma. Right. So you, you think it was a, a demon maybe? I don't know. Or like, do I would you love think that is a sign say, that she picked that out? I don't know. That's the thing. Like none of this stuff I can truly explain. And like, there's things that I could tell you that I've experienced that makes no logical sense. Right. But it's happened. And this is one of those 90% of life. Yeah. I mean, like think about all the people that have freaking like that gut feeling and they say, always go Mm. with your gut, blah, blah. There's something to that. What that is. I heck if I know. You know what I mean? Yeah, I I think so too. I agree to that. There's something 
something we don't understand about that gut feeling sometimes. Like UFOs can't explain it. Never have experienced it. Would love to experience Mm -hmm. ghost realm. I've experienced it. I know it exists. No one can tell me otherwise. I've experienced things. I know things. I could tell stories that would run shiver down people's spines. Not going to do it on this podcast. We're going to get a little (laughs) bit more brave. Okay. I just gave you the little, the little candy coating versions, a teaser, a teaser, little teaser. But you know, those things that I've experienced. So when I hear stories like this, things moving, Mm -hmm. levitating, I watched a small plate fly off a table, but more importantly, it's either porcelain or clay hit the floor. Didn't break. Yeah. Which is impossible. In my brain is impossible. Is it possible? Maybe in my brain, no chips, nothing. Yeah. And it's fine. That makes no, and even if it, even if the table is three foot off the ground, right. I would think if it fell and it hit an edge, it would at least chip at a minimum. I, I would expect that. But I, I mean, there's a lot of factors on that part. Oh, the, for fact, sure. the, the supernatural thing is it flying off, not so much that it didn't get damaged, I guess. See, I look at it all though, because I sit there and yeah. I think, that doesn't make sense, but neither did this, neither did that's just a, my brain's very yeah. analytical. And if I can't fit something into an analytical box, I go, wait a second. That doesn't make sense. Neither does that. Neither does that. Does yeah. it correlate? Does it go into the same, the same things? Yeah. But this story of Roland Doe fits into that. I've seen some of these things, not like that. Thank God. Right. But I've seen enough yeah, you don't paranormal where I go, no, there ain't no way. There's no way I wanna know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, not to well, I, I not want to stay to away from demon. <laughs> no. I, I want to know. I want to be there. I want to see it. Like me with UFOs. That's what I want, Nick. See, this yeah. is why we gotta get big enough, Nick. We gotta get these people to start liking our podcast. Right. You better like a dog on podcast. Wherever you That's listen right. to it, you better like it. Review or demons us. will get you. Demons, it's going to get you. Listen, I don't want to tell your story on this thing. I just don't want to do it. I think it'd be bad. Yeah. Or if we do tell your story, are we going to spin it like you're cool or you're not cool? (laughs) Like you don't want to go through a horrible experience and then have some random guy saying how uncool you are. How uncool you are. That's exactly right. That would suck. (laughs) So, Nick, where do you fall into this category of this story? Oh, boy. I would like to believe it. And if I accepted everything that was witnessed as they witnessed it that way, I would say, I believe something is going on, but Good enough. Ah, it's, I want to believe so bad. You don't understand. He's the Mahler. I, okay. I'll, t- I'll give you a little thing. I, once upon a time, I was religious. Mm -hmm. And I liked that lifestyle a lot. Sure. And I'm not now. And I wish that I believed things more because I like to believe things. Out of curiosity, what caused you to go from religious to agnostic? I don't think it was. You don't have to give the. I don't think it was any one thing. I think it was Mm -hmm. just. I I fell out of belief and a lot of people would say, well, you were never really religious in the first place. But I say, you know what? I, I never it. questioned it. And I liked it. I If mm-hmm. I could snap my fingers and go back to that, sure would. People are like, don't you want to only believe things that are true? And I'm like, nah. I want to <laughs> believe what I want to believe. I want to have fun. <laughs> you Absolutely. Know? I don't want to have existential fear which is something that a lot of religious people don't deal with. And I do deal with sure. that. So that's the thing. I think a lot of times is not necessarily, I think organized religion oftentimes is what hurts mm. belief more yeah. so than anything else. That's why I asked the question I asked, because most of the people that I see that go from religious to non-religious have mm. one of three epiphanies. One, they hear a counter argument that sounds logical and they go, uh-huh. hmm, and it makes them question stuff. So then they back up and then they, because this one thing may have fooled them, they go, it all must be fake. 
Mm-hmm. Two, something they cannot explain either logically or illogically. So they just go, this can't be real. Mm. Or three, the third thing is due to the masses around them, they get pulled from a certain area based on the fact that no one else believes this. Here's their counter arguments. I don't know that I can live on that same plateau. Mm. And most of the time that happens because their friends say X, Y, and Z, they go to organize religion and then they get disappointed is the best yeah. way I can put it. Yeah. I that kind of falls that. into that fact court. Yeah. So I don't know. There's actually a story that I'm working on right now. I've been researching it for a while, but I want to make sure I go into it. Right. Mm-hmm. Taking, cause it's hard when you believe something It's very hard to not, Push your own thought process in there. And I'm trying really hard. Mm. I'm probably coming at it too skeptical and I'm going to be mad at myself at the end of it. But I want to see how you navigate that story. I'm really okay. curious. I really, I want to know what your thought processes is. I want to know why you think the way you think it's fascinating to me. Well, that's why I like when I choose stories, I choose ones that, I feel like I can gain some glimpse into your thought processes about like that's, to me, that's the fun part. Yeah. Says. Yeah. It's like learning about the person you're talking to and we have different Correct. perspectives on some things and same perspectives on others. And I find that interesting. hundred percent. That's the beauty of some of our listeners. Also, mm-hmm. we do get comments from time to time. And I'm fascinated with what you guys say too. So don't Uh ever hesitate to put something in the comments. Don't ever hesitate. Oh no. I'll respond. As long as it's respectful, I'll always respond. Mm. I have zero issues responding to anybody, but I find it very interesting. Different thought processes on different things and just people arguing in the comments. I just, yeah, I find, I don't see it as arguing. I see it as let's say debating. Let's call it debating. debating. Correct. Yeah. As long as it's respectful. If you're unrespectful, I delete it and I keep moving. I don't, yeah. we don't need that in our lives. And we'll make fun of you on the podcast. No, just kidding. hundred <laughs> percent. I might. <laughs> well, Nick, I think we rocked this one out. I don't think there's anything oh, yeah. left. We rocked yeah, we it out. We covered so I, many freaking topics here. This is wild. We did. This was philosophy. But it all fits together. That's the crazy thing. Yeah. I think it all fits. Yeah, we need one of those boards with strings on it. Like, it's all part we of do. the same. Wait, I got a question. It's all the same. Hmm. Did this child live in a national park? <laughs> <laughs> I did not look up if there was a national park nearby, Nick. I probably yeah, should have. I suspect there is. We'll, we'll look that up separately. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that they all fit together, though. Think about yeah. all the cases. They all fit that's why I keep pulling from other things, even when it doesn't seem to fit. I just grab yeah. the piece and I go, does this fit here? Pink. Yeah. Does this fit here? Nope. Pink. And that's how here? I do puzzles Pink. in real life. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Me too. It's super fascinating. Yeah, it know. is. This it is really how is. we go from ghost stories to demonic, to Bigfoot, to freaking UFOs, to yeah. the Matrix, to all kinds of stuff. It all seems to fit. Yeah. There's something going on the, here. This is why Unsolved Mysteries was so interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Robert Stack. What other podcast can you come to? And we've, in the middle of a demon story, we talk about a saber toothed tiger. This one. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. This one. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Where, everybody, until we see you in the next one. Goodbye. <laughs> Talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs>